Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. If you are a dog lover, especially a dog lover who's on TikTok, you may have come across one particular genre of dog video. Press Bubba. You want itchy, itchy? Okay, come in. I'll give you itchy, itchy, Bubba. Come. Come on. You're such a good girl. A dog stands in front of an array of buttons arranged on the floor and presses them, sometimes in sequence, to make sounds. Okay. Outside what? Play. Outside play? You can go play outside. Now. Yeah, we can go play right now. We, we can do that. We can do that. What exactly is going on here? Do the dogs actually understand the meaning of these particular words, or are they just well-trained animals? Federico Rossano is trying to answer those questions and is one step closer with some new research. Federico is an associate professor in the Department of Cognitive Science at the University of California, San Diego, and head of the Comparative Cognition Lab. And he's just published a study which suggests that dogs, yes, indeed, can understand specific words and respond appropriately. He is in San Diego today. Federico, good morning. Good morning. We heard a little bit of these dogs in action. People might have seen this, as I said, on TikTok. The hashtag is dog buttons. Describe for people who haven't seen this, what these dog button setups actually are and what's going on in the videos. So the device that these animals are using are usually made of buttons on which you can record your own voice. So for example, you can record the word outside and when the button gets pushed, then you can hear the word outside. But you can record play and then you can hear play. And uh, most people tend to place them on the ground. Some people like to put them on the wall. And when the dog or cat presses the button, uh, usually they can hear that word. Part of the activity is for the humans to train the dog to respond to these buttons. And then, of course, the dog at some point start using the buttons to communicate with the humans. And our task is to assess, are they actually communicating or using the human as a vending machine? A vending machine. (laughs) (laughs) These videos are very popular. And I mean, there are some of the dogs, they're like celebrities uh, on TikTok. There's dog Bunny, which uh, is everywhere. When you saw... This, as a scientist, when you saw this, what was your reaction? Well, fun fact, I saw Bunny when she was still a puppy and Mm -hmm. she wasn't quite as popular on uh, TikTok. I was not on TikTok and she's a participant in our study. And uh, I was intrigued. I thought, hey, it looks like, you know, this dog seems to be using these buttons in potentially interesting ways. But as a scientist, I was also skeptical. I was skeptical because of what we know about previous research with this type of devices with other animals. And I was skeptical because, of course, there's always the issue of potentially cherry picking clips, right? It's like you just happen to have the one clip that seems to make sense. Mm. And so my next reaction was like, if we're going to study it, we need to have not one or two or 10 dogs. We need to have thousands of dogs so that we can actually assess what is going on. How much science is there that exists right now about how dogs communicate and and how many words that we might speak, how many of them they actually understand? So there is a little bit. Uh, I wish there was much more. So there's uh, some research that has been done with individual dogs. One in particular was called Rico that got published in Nature about 10 years ago, suggesting that Rico knew more than 250 words. Uh, Then there was another paper with another dog called Chaser, suggesting that Chaser could actually get to more than a thousand words. But they were always names of objects. And the evidence was that the dog was asked to go fetch it and retrieve it. There's been other research asking owners how many words they think the dog knows. And what I think is kind of interesting is that when the study was done in Hungary, the average Hungarian dog knows about 33 words. Mm. And when it was done in Canada, the average Canadian dog knows 85 words. Mm. So I don't know if Canadian dogs happen to be three times <laughs> as, as capable. I'm not as saying the that the dogs words. here are smarter, but they might be. <laughs> They might be. So, I mean, that would be, that could be. But basically, as you can imagine, just like if you ask a parent, you know, how many words does your child know? Mm. Some parents might just be a little 
critical and others might be a little overconfident or optimistic. And so part of the issue was, how do we really assess what the average dog knows? Well, this, and this is the work that you did, but I mean, going into this, one of the things, I mean, I say this to somebody who has a dog is you can train your dog to, to do all sorts of things. And your dog understands, you know, the word treat, the dog understands walk, the dog understands bath because it's trained to do that. How much of, of what we saw in those videos is just the dogs being trained to know that if they push this button, they might get something or something might happen. Well, that is sort of part of the question, right? In many ways, that is exactly what's going on. So basically, the the dog learns an association between a word and a specific sort of situation or reward. Part of the new idea or challenge here was that very often you might think that the dog understands the word treat, but really what the dog sees is you moving towards the cupboards and opening the cupboards, what usually treats are, and it's just responding to the behavioral cues you're producing. Mm. Similarly, it could be they see you putting on shoes and your jacket and moving towards the door and they're like, oh, you said outside, but really I don't understand the word outside. I just read your behavior and figure out this is what's going on. So we do believe believe that they do associate sounds with sort of activities. We know they respond to commands. Of course, you can train a dog to go fetch or sit or uh, whatever. But there wasn't clear evidence that they would respond to the buttons per se. So one of the concerns was that what is really happening is that the dog is just paying attention to the humans and whatever the human gives away as a cue, that's what the dog is responding to. And second, that really it doesn't even matter what the button says, it's really the location of the button that does all the work so that you just learn an association like I see you touching this and that's that's what you're responding to. Mm. So we wanted to show that these animals are actually paying attention to the words and that in particular they are responding not just to the owner producing certain cues, but to even an experimenter that gives away no no uh, sort of behavioral cues. Well, and that's the other thing is behavioral cues, right? The dogs, I mean, the belief is, and again, if you have a dog, you know this, I mean, their dog can, can read not just how you're, where you're moving, but, but how you're acting, can read, for example, facial cues as well. So how did you go about testing that? So this is the beauty of dogs. Dogs are amazing at understanding human communication. They're much better than any other animal we know, especially much better than chimpanzees. Really? Um, yeah, absolutely. There's very strong evidence showing that dogs understand human gestures. They understand facial expressions. They pay attention to our intonation to detect whether they should approach something or stay away from them. And we also have evidence that if they hear you cry, their heart rate changes. Hmm. Uh, Although they don't respond to our laughter quite the same way. They don't find the same thing we find funny, funny, which is, you know, reasonable. Uh, but basically, there's very strong evidence that the dogs are almost like the neglected animal in terms of their social intelligence with respect to humans. They are very tuned in. And uh, because of that, of course, it's not surprising that they might just learn a lot about, you know, patterns and your behaviors and realize that whenever you do one, two, three steps, then the next thing that happens is this type of reward. After all, many people might have heard of Pavlov's dog, mm -hmm. right? It's like learning an association with a bell and then getting a food reward. So because of that, we needed to control for this possible explanation of their responses to buttons. And so we created a scenario in which uh, we had two experimenters going into people's homes across the US. And uh, what would happen is that one, in, one experimenter would put tape on top of the buttons uh, so that you couldn't see what was written on them and then would go with the owner in a separate room. And uh, the other experimenter with headphones on uh, would press the buttons with the tapes on and just look at the dog without knowing what they just had pressed. And then we would have other researchers that had videos of the dog responses without hearing any audio, basically annotate and, and sort of see what do they think the dog is responding to and what do they think the dog is doing. And so our goal was to see, uh, do the dog respond in contextually appropriate ways, uh, which would be the same as saying, if I ask you, can you pass me the salt and you actually give me the salt? I'm assuming you understand what I what I just did. Mm -hmm. And so sort of that's kind of the idea. It's like we do not know what are the representations of concepts like outside, play, uh, food. We're doing more testing right now. But we definitely know that they are responding in an appropriate manner, even though the experimenter, because they cannot hear anything and they cannot 
they don't know which button they pressed, they cannot give any cue about what would be the appropriate response. So your belief is that the dogs have some capacity to understand the words that we're saying, some of the words we're saying. Well, at the very least, they have the same capacity that a two or three year old would seem to have when you just tell them things. Like they produce behaviors that seem to be in accordance to them understanding them. So the question is really, what does it mean to understand? And if, if you take a behavioral point of view, if I tell you to stop and you stop, if I ask you for, can you bring me something and you bring the correct item, then I would say you understand whether you, you know, understand also why I'm asking you to do this right now and what are my intentions. That's a different type of question. But at the basic level of when I say outside, do you understand that we're talking about going outside of the house or when I say play? that there's going to be some kind of game involved and maybe toy involved. And when I say food, that, you know, we're talking about things you can eat. Yes, to that degree, they definitely understand it. So you were skeptical when you started this. I mean, has your research convinced you? I'm skeptical at the idea that what is going on is significantly more complex than what I was saying as treating others as a vending machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the researchers slowly convinced me that at least for some individuals, there seems to be more to it. And the reason I, I'm seeing this is because I see these dogs doing back and forth with the humans uh, in a way that uh, we would do a back and forth when we are negotiating, right? So if, I, if I'm like, you know, I want outside and you're like, no, not now. And I say, well, maybe we could do this other thing. And they say, no, then to me, it seems like, you know, they are understanding something about what you're trying to do, including the fact that you are stalling and not getting them to do what they want to do. I also am very convinced and anybody who has a dog is knows this that our dogs understand a lot of things you know after all they've been domesticated so we have lived with them for 10,000 years and we have selected them because they have this special ability to understand us and and cooperate with us so I don't you know if the question is are these dogs talking? The answer is no, they're not talking. Can they use these buttons to communicate? Um, we have research that might point in that direction, and we are confident that there's more to it than meets the eye. But again, you know, we need to do more work. They're not talking, but if they're reasoning or negotiating with us, I want to go outside, you can go outside later, let's go outside now. That sounds like a conversation at the very least. Right. So the problem again is like a lot of a lot of scientists are concerned at the idea that we are saying they are talking. They are communicating one hundred percent. I think part of the idea of talking is uh, the concern that we're now trying to anthropomorphize yeah. these creatures, and that's not fair, right? So it seems to me though that they have the ability to communicate, and there's no doubt about it that they seem to understand responses in a way that allow them to make some basic inference, right? It's like <laughs> that you don't want to go now, but I want now. So how about, <laughs> how about we say now? Or, you know, if I ask you to do what outside and you say play or you say pee or you say uh, whatever else, like clearly, if you can give me different answers to this question, that are all contextually appropriate. Well, that to me shows some level of understanding of what can you do outside, right? Which again, is like, a level of representation of what could happen to you in the future, which is novel for a lot of us. Like a lot of people think that animals are stuck in time, and I don't think that's true. So, you know, if you can imagine yourself being outside playing with your human, uh, well, that's already something, right? It's like it tells us you can imagine a future in which this thing is happening. And so there's a lot of interesting questions that you can start address if you can show that they understand the meaning of some of these patterns, that they can actively and intentionally select these buttons to communicate things that they want, desire. And there's another angle to it, which I think is almost more intriguing, which is we have this idea that what really matters for these dogs is can they understand commands or can they understand, you know, fetch this, yeah. go get that. And what happened when they have these buttons is that they actually initiate the conversation. So now they're having a voice to start the communication, right? So that they can be asking you for things instead of being responding to your needs and wants and so on. And I think uh, in terms of, you know, empowering and giving others a chance to tell us what they think about or what they care about, 
I think it's, you know, it could be an opportunity to learn more about what goes on in a dog's mind and provide for them, right? Some of my favorite examples are dogs complaining that it's too hot outside mm. or that there's a stranger outside, which usually is the Amazon delivery guy that is just standing there trying to figure out where to drop something. Or, you know, there's it's too loud outside because maybe there's construction work going on or there's an ambulance passing by. All these things are things that bother them. And we use and we kind of have a sense of this, but you don't necessarily know, you know, how much it bothers them or how concerned they might be and so on. And if they can tell you this, then maybe you can address it in the same way in which they can tell you when they're in pain. And I think that's fascinating. We've been talking a lot about dogs. You can imagine people in the cat lobby who would be saying, what about cats? Are cats smart as well? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Thank you for the question. The great news is we do have 700 cats in the study and I wish we could get some more. Cats are amazing. Uh, there's research, recent work that has shown that if cats are willing to participate and to be trained, cats are almost as good as dogs. Uh, pretty remarkable, really. Uh, so we have several that have several dozen buttons, and uh, many of them that seem to be using them in ways that are quite similar to what the dogs are doing. Mm. Uh, we have more dogs with more buttons, if you will, but I am really impressed by several cats out there and what they seem to be able to do with these buttons. Just before I let you go, I mean, you were hinting at the complexity of some of these, and whether they're conversations or whether it's just communication that we might be having with dogs. Social media is just filled with these videos. Let me play something else of dogs using different combinations of words that represent emotions. Have a listen to this. You mad? Why, why mad? You want help? Help what? Toy. Oh, you want help with the toy? Okay, let's go get your toy. So the dog says it's mad because it wants help getting the toy. What does that tell you about how complex this communication could be? Well, again, this is uh, uh, N of one, right? So as a scientist, you need to say, this is very interesting, but it's just one <laughs> interaction. One video. So that was, yeah. One video. So we need to you know, be careful in how we interpret it. What I can tell you is I have seen other instances with similar situations where they would ask for help because something is stuck under the couch or is uh, behind the door and they need the human to help. Fun fact, we have a study currently under review in which we create a situation in which the dog needs help and we see would the dog actively go to the soundboard and call for the name of the owner and push the button help. And if you want to know what the finding is, uh, call me back in a few months <laughs> when the paper is out. But the, the thing about communication that I think is important is like when the dog pushes several buttons, often in a sequence, you know, the big question is, is this random or do they have some kind of order? And is this order just purely matching what they've been trained with or is it potentially novel, right? So I can say, want food and maybe that's what you trained but do i ever switch to want outside or want water or want toy and if i do that basically i've now moved on from like learning just the sequence to actually learning what want means and uh, substituting things that i want uh after that. Mm. And so part of the open question for us, and this is again another paper we currently have under review is, can we show to what degree the sequences are random or not? And I can tell you, I can give you a little piece of news, they're not random. So that's good news. But then, you know, the work needs to go into what degree are they flexible? Or are they always the same sequences that get repeated? Because those are the ones that were trained by the humans. Mm. Either way, what I hope is the case, and I think people who are training with the buttons should, you know, comment on this is, I do think that giving dogs and cats a chance to initiate the communication, basically having them tell you when they're hungry or tired or when they want to play or when they want outside, uh, hopefully gives them a little more voice and control over their life. And I think, you know, if we care about them, having them tell you what they need, uh, instead of us just trying to guess it, it's hopefully a contribution to their welfare. The research is fascinating, and I look forward to hearing more about it. Federico, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Federico Rosano is an associate professor in the Department of Cognitive Science at the University of California, San Diego, and head 
of the Comparative Cognition Lab.